Well, I'm sure many of you have probably heard the name Soren Kierkegaard. He was a famous 19th century Danish philosopher. He's known for many of his philosophical treaties, but one thing that probably not a lot of people have heard are some of the stories that he would tell and trying to um, give sort of an uh, apologetic understanding of the Christian faith. So when he was arguing with skeptical people about how to grapple with the kind of bizarre nature of the Christian story, he would tell something of a story like this. It's a story of an unbelievably humble king, and I'll be quoting him a little bit, but I'm paraphrasing large portions of what he said here. So he would say this, suppose there was a king who loved a humble maiden. He decided he wanted to marry her. Now keep in mind, this is a powerful and mighty king, and as a king, he could have whoever he wanted. And every dignitary uh, that was uh, nearby, feared his wrath, and every foreign state that he associated with would tremble before his power. So even if he did marry a commoner, even if he set his heart on that, even though that might be looked down upon by any neighboring nation, all the ambassadors from all the nations, all the nobles from the royal family would still send representatives to the wedding out of reverence and respect for this great and powerful king. And the king knew that if he asked his court officials about his decision, they would say something along the lines of, your majesty is about to confer a favor upon this maiden for which she can never be sufficiently grateful her whole life long. But the king saw that as kind of being the problem. Even if she really did want to marry this king, he would never know for certain if she loved him for him, or if she simply, like everybody else, feared how powerful and respected he was. So he wrestled with this for some time, thinking about what he might do. And finally, he decided this. If she could not come up to his high station, if she could not ascend, quote unquote, to his throne, then and, and, and that he would be sure that she loves him freely, if she could not do that, then he decided he must then descend to her station in life. And to descend to her station means that he must be stripped of all his royal power and wealth, for only then would he know that his beloved loved him truly and freely and as equals. So that's exactly what this king did. He laid aside all his powers, all his privileges, all his rights, all his royalty, and he came to her as an equal to win her love. Now what Kierkegaard understood well, I think, in using this story is that good kingship is not really often what people think about when they think about kings. It's not about the king being able to make people ascend upwards towards him. Rather, what marks a, a good king is that the king is able to descend down to his people. Now here in this evening's passage, we have lost sight of the arrogance of Jonah for just a minute. He doesn't even figure in to this portion of uh, the book. We don't even see Jonah this evening. And for a moment, we take our eyes from Jonah and all his many failures and foibles, and instead, we refocus our eyes on this anonymous and humble king in Nineveh, this king of the Assyrians. And in this king, we begin to also see how important it is to have a king that will not uh, insist people come up to his station, but that would descend down to their station, who would join his people in the ashes of their life. But before we get there, let's review kind of where we've been in the book of Jonah. Last week, we entered the second half of the book in chapter 3, and we saw that Jonah had barely made his way into Nineveh. He was just on the outskirts, not really where he should have been, and he preached the world's shortest sermon. In Hebrew, it's only five words. In English, it's eight, but if we had to strip it down to five words, we could say that his sermon was this. Forty days, Nineveh will overturn. And Jonah, in his self-righteousness, was probably ready after that short sermon to shake the dust off of his feet 
and get the heck out of Dodge and to leave these people, these very puzzled and, and um, questioning people, uh, leave it up to them to figure out the rest. But in this upside down, not tragedy, but comedy of a story, God again gets the last laugh because the Ninevites, after hearing the world's maybe worst sermon, heard it and we read in the scriptures that they believed God. And we talked about that last week. They didn't believe Jonah, they believed God. And then they repent, both inwardly, we see, with fasting and outwardly, they repent with sackcloth and ashes. But this week, something even more incredible happens than just sort of the people on the outskirts, kind of the commoners, the suburbanites, those people repenting, although that is remarkable. Something even more incredible happens when we see the king and all of his most wealthy and powerful nobles follow the leadership of the people by also, in turn, repenting. So let's look again at verse 6, where we started. The word reached the king of Nineveh. He arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Now again, this is a, a pretty remarkable scene, and for many reasons. And I want to highlight just a few of the things that are kind of remarkable about what we see this unknown king doing. First, it would seem that, according to the story at least, that this word came to the king pretty organically, pretty grassroots. In other words, Jonah did not march into the halls of the palaces of Nineveh and proclaim this message. Instead, it seems like that the word that Jonah had preached out on the outskirts of town had been well received by the people. They started to believe it and act on it. And so that word started to spread through the city like wildfire, and it eventually reached the king. Now, we believe as Christians when the Spirit of God speaks and he gives his holy and life-giving message to whoever he's intending on hearing it, that he can even give an evil and perishing world new life through this message. And this is exactly often how we see the Holy Spirit spread the good news of the gospel, not through, um, not through mighty prophets, not ultimately through anybody of significance, but through regular people that believe it and then in turn preach it themselves and are changed by it so much that it compels others to listen and to also be changed by it. So even though Jonah is, is kind of a failed prophet in, in the sense of his, uh, um, of his qualification for service, even though he's failed in every moral category, he is not failed as a prophet and a, an evangelist. The, Lord, the, the word of the Lord has gone out through his hesitant lips and his kind of hedging um, sermon that the Holy Spirit has been successful and triumphant, even through such a broken and in some sense, useless vessel like Jonah. And this is exactly how we see God work in the world. As Christians, we believe that a good that we can do for our neighbors, the first and foremost thing that we can do is point them to Jesus. We talked about that this morning, even in our sermon in Mark. When we come before people, we don't have to fear what we'll say. We don't have to be anxious about it because Jesus promises that even if we're in really precarious situations where people are against us, that the Holy Spirit will fill us up with the words that we need to say. We don't need an education. We don't need to have gone to university, to seminary. We don't need to have read a thousand books. We don't need to know the Hebrew and the Aramaic and the Greek. We only have to be obedient to speak what the Spirit gives us to say. And he does that through our world, through common people like you and me. And I'm sure Every person in our, our church could say that the people that maybe have impacted them the most of Christians have not been anybody that will be remembered by church history. Many of the people that have been the most influential Christians in my life, I doubt that anybody would ever write a biography about their theology. Instead, the Holy Spirit has spoken through just ordinary people like us, and that gives us a lot of hope that even though um, we feel like we don't have a lot of power and a lot of say-so in the world, that the Holy Spirit chooses to speak through people like Jonah 
through people like us. So that's a remarkable thing as we see. Secondly, a, a strange thing about this whole scene with the king, and this seems kind of obvious, maybe, but the king responds positively. He hears the word and he uh, obeys it. Now, this is remarkable because there are other Assyrian kings in Scripture that hear the word of the Lord and do not obey it. So I'm thinking of, for instance, another Assyrian emperor king that we read about in 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19. Now, that king's name, as we know, was Sennacherib, and he was proudly heralded as the great king, and he fancied himself stronger than all the gods of the enemies of, uh, of, of the enemies that were other nations. So he fancied himself even stronger than Israel's God, Yahweh. But his pride led to his destruction because after a failed and disastrous siege on Jerusalem, he, with his tail tucked between his legs, we read, goes back home to his city of Nineveh only to be mercilessly assassinated by his own sons in his own temple to his own gods. So much for his greatness, right? So much for him being greater than Yahweh. Well, the king in this book is completely unlike that other Ninevite king. This nameless king, who again, we know Sennacherib's name, but we don't know this one, uh, he heeds the word that comes from ultimately from the Lord through Jonah, and humbles himself before Yahweh. That really is a remarkable thing. Think of all the times that we see the message of the Lord go before rulers and principalities and powers in our world, or, or how we see that so often in, in the scriptures, and they don't seem to respond positively. So this king has really done a remarkable thing by the power of the Spirit. And so we read that after hearing the word of the Lord, he, like Jonah, is described as arising. Now, I think that's an intentional word that the author of this book has used. He arose just like Jonah did. And you'll remember that originally Jonah arose so he could descend away from God. But then, after coming out of the belly of the fish, he arose and finally went up to Nineveh. And so he arose from the seat of his, originally he arose from the seat of um, uh, as a right-hand man of an evil uh, Israelite king named Jeroboam. And so he's arriving from, in some sense, a seat of power. And likewise, we see that this king also does arise from his throne. And so this is kind of a remarkable scene in and of itself, because in the ancient world, when a king was seated, uh, that meant that there was really nothing for them to do, that they had absolute power. They had no matters that they needed to attend to, so they could sit there and rest, and they could let their slaves or their servants or their cupbearers or whoever um, or their generals be the people that do all the work for them. But here we see that this king doesn't stay sitting. He arises. He stands because he has some work to do, and that work to do is to join alongside of his people in repenting with them and repenting for them. So like Jonah, this king arises. And like Jonah, too, this king also descends. But he doesn't descend in pride away to a port city and descend into a ship hiding from God. He arises and descends down into the dust, down into the sackcloth and ashes of repentance. He descends into obedience to God's word. He strips off his royal robe, we hear. He abandons all dignity, and he puts on the scratchy and unflattering and humiliating sackcloth that's representative of mourning, of sorrow, and of repentance. And he with his people sits in ashes, not in a golden throne, but in dusty, dirty ashes, symbolizing not kingly power, symbolizing not somebody that has it together, but symbolizing an absolute powerlessness before a holy and just God. Everything about this scene is just unbelievable, really. And yet another remarkable thing about this king and how repenting publicly like this, he's actually following the wisdom of his own people. 
Now, as modern people, this probably doesn't strike us as strange or bizarre, as if we were ancients. And it's hard for us who live in a Western world with the idea of democracy to imagine. But to see a king in the ancient world, many of whom were essentially equated with divine power, with the gods' wills uh, um, in the world, whatever gods that they worship, um, to be kind of representative of that and to be thought of as that, it was strange to see that a king would, uh, would uh, acquiesce to anybody's desire but his own. And so we see that this king follows the lead, not of the gods, not of his own intuition. He follows the lead of his lowly servant class people. That's just absolutely unheard of at this point in human history. And that's just one more way we see that when Jesus promises, for instance, in scripture, that the first of this world will be last, we see glimpses of that even in, in uh, the, the message of Jonah. The first people that repent and receive God's mercy are the least of these. And then it does get to the king, but even though he was the first in command, he may be the last to hear of it, but fortunately for him, he repents too. This is just one way, another way, we see that God's um, mercy and grace extends to the people of Nineveh. You remember last week that Jonah used the, um, the phrase, he used the word that God would overturn Nineveh. Now he meant that to overturn Nineveh in destruction. But God intended to not just overturn, but to turn over Nineveh and repentance, to flip um, what seems normal in this world and make it uh, not of a worldly kingdom, of his kingdom. And so we see the proud who normally push away from God, the, the proud become humbled and seek out God's forgiveness in his face. And so we see that really, strangely, the most humble person in this entire book, the one who does the most and insists on repenting the most of all people is the king of Nineveh, the king of this incredibly wicked and evil people. And in, seven, in verses seven and eight, we see that not only does he repent, but he really doubles down on the repentance that should be at throughout the entire land. And we read this. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. So the king, with the support of his entire wealthy and powerful um, nobles and, and, and dignitaries issues not just a proclamation to the citizens of Nineveh, but the Hebrew word indicates here he issues kind of a, a cry, desperate cry, which we understand not just as directed towards everybody, but is also directed towards God himself. He cries out towards the heavens. And just as God told Jonah that he would cry out against Nineveh, for um, their evils, we see now um, that Nineveh is crying out towards God and repentance. You see that reversal that's happening there? Again, the, there's a lot of cleverness in the, the, the storytelling of this book. And so what does this king cry out? Well, we read something even stranger than we've read before, that neither human nor animal, not any herd, not any flock, not any cattle, none of them uh, should taste a single thing. They should, uh, they should also fast. And oh, by the way, even the animals should be wearing sackcloth too. So the king, I think, understands something really profound here when it comes to the very idea of repentance. He understands that Nineveh's repentance should be so thorough, so all-encompassing, so complete, and so totalizing that even their source of prosperity, even their um, animals, which from which they get food and drink, from which they get clothing and labor and transportation and all manner of commerce, even their means of wealth 
even these things should be offered up to God in repentance. In other words, when we hear in Scripture that people are to love the Lord with all their soul and strength and mind and, and body, everything, when they, when they should love the Lord with everything in them, we see that the king of Nineveh is insisting that everything in Nineveh, everything that moves, crawls, breathes, every part of them should repent. The king, the nobles, the citizens, and for goodness sake, even the livestock. Literally, every profitable and proud aspect of their society should throw themselves on the mercy of God. None of them, we read, are to taste goodness. None of them are to rely on food or water for comfort or even nourishment. None of them are even to spare themselves of the humility of, of wrapping themselves in burlap sacks in the sight of God, and that includes the cows and the sheep. Now, Old Testament scholar Tim Mackey notes that there's a real humor in what's going on here. That he, and he says, not even old Bessie, the milk cow, should spare herself from repenting before her sins before God. Now, I don't know about you, sometimes we'll joke in our house that if the cat acts up in a certain way that we say, oh, you should apologize or you should repent. And of course we laugh at that because that's silly. But what seems silly is not so silly in the eyes of, of the Ninevites. They realize that even their smallest little creatures um, that they have as pets, even these things are beholden to a good and sovereign God. And that is exactly the kind of scene we see here, that even the animals are set to repent of their sins. The king wants all the people to join with him in calling out to God. He wants the cows to moo out before God. He wants the sheep to bleat out before God. The king wants them to do literally all they can to turn away from their evil, to give up their violence, everything that they're guilty of, from the least of these, the animals, to the greatest of these, the king. And look at the last sentence here in verse 9 of the king's speech to God. He says, who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Now this isn't just kind of a, uh, a word of false modesty, like something we might get from Jonah. Instead, we can partly tell, um, uh, uh, or this doesn't mean rather that um, uh, that he's just saying this, not knowing. In other words, he's not just saying this um, with some sort of false humility, but he sincerely is concerned that God may or may not turn from his um, anger. And we can partly tell that this is that case because throughout the book, the word of God um, uh, is always presented as coming from the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. In other words, it comes from Yahweh. But remember, Jonah, in preaching his sermon, said that Nineveh would be overturned, but he didn't even say who was going to overturn it, who they had offended. And so the king here doesn't use the name Yahweh and hoping that God would relent. Instead, he just uses the the generic word for God, so that maybe whatever God is out there that might be angry with us um, may relent. And he's hoping that all of his concerted and corporate effort along with all his people and all their animals, all these things that are offered up to this unknown God, that maybe this God really truly will relent and will pass over them and that they won't perish. So what do we read in verse 10? When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, indeed, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. And that's the beautiful thing of this story, and that's the beautiful nature of the God of the Bible. We may not very well know his personal name and his personal attributes, but if we turn to him asking in faith for mercy, for grace, with repentant and humble hearts, we may not know all that we need to know or all that we really should know, 
about ourselves or about him, but it is in his character to relent from his anger and to show mercy and grace for people. The author writes that the very same God whose name that they don't know does indeed see their repentance, and he does, that, and that they turn from their evil, and he does indeed relent of bringing the disaster that they so deserve upon their heads. But folks, let's also not forget that these are indeed extremely evil people. We've talked about it for several weeks, the wicked things they would do, the inhumane torture and brutality that they would uh, wage against their enemies and warfare, the, the mockery they would make of people, the utter humiliation and desecration of people was a horrific thing. They did monstrous things, not only to the outside world, but even to each other. So God may have relented from his burning anger at their violence and their injustice, but the question remains for us to consider how would they be atoned for? How would their sins uh, be atoned for, for these brutal things that they did to one another? And it turns out that their own king, who is incredibly supernaturally, it seems, humble and repented before the Lord, this is really not enough to undo all the terrible things that both he and they have done as a society together. It turns out that they would need another humble king to save them from their own evil. They would need a king, one like Kierkegaard described in our opening kind of fairy tale for this evening. One who, from great love, would also arise from his heavenly throne, but only to descend into the ashes of a sinful and, and dying world to atone for its sins. And Christians, we believe that in Jesus Christ, that we do indeed have such a king that could atone for us in our sins. The Apostle Paul writes in Philippians when he's encouraging this church to have fellowship with one another, to have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped onto, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We believe, folks, that this Jesus is the King that Nineveh and the whole world needs, a King that not only humbles himself, but a King that can atone for all the sins of our past and all the sins we may commit now and all the sins we could possibly commit in the future. Somebody that could actually atone for those things. And as it turns out, not just Nineveh, but the world needed to see this Jesus, a king who would leave the glories of heaven behind. And he would take on the form of a servant by putting on the humiliating sackcloth that is a human body by fasting with us, by, uh, by sitting in ashes with us and leaving all of his eternal glory behind for a time so that he could be with us in all of our pain and sorrow and sin and hurt. This Jesus, who is God with us, left his throne of light and of glory to be enthroned instead on the humiliating cross. And it was there where the wrath and justice of God for sins of all manner of people throughout all time and space was poured out on him, while the love and forgiveness of God was poured out on the people of Nineveh, on Jonah, and even on us. Friends, as, as, as our brother Martin Luther 
once warmly reminded us that the Christian life is one of daily repentance. So what does that mean? It means that every day we turn ourselves daily, we orient ourselves daily towards God. In Him we find comfort and forgiveness. In Him we find uh, grace and mercy, not death and destruction. So let us be like this humble king that we read about who came down from his throne and sat in ashes. May we even more so be people that um, crawl out of the thrones of our own lives and our own self-worship and sit in the ashes of the gospel for us. And even more than that, let us turn to the even better, the even greater humble king of glory, Jesus Christ, who humbled himself beyond ashes and went to death on a cross for us. So that when we repent and when we turn to him, indeed, God does relent of his justice and gives us life and life abundantly. Let's pray. Father, help us not to rend our garments, but our hearts. Help us to repent of our sins of self-reliance and self-righteousness, and instead turn to the goodness of Jesus, our humbled yet glorified King, who gives us grace and mercy, his love and forgiveness. May we be a people who constantly turn to him to find everything that we could ever want or need, for it's in his name that we ask and pray all these things. Amen.